Welcome back to the third video about the details of the Lexus NLX903633 3-axis magnetometer. In the previous video, we implemented three messages going from our little chip to our master, indicating if there's some error or if it's simply ready. Plus, we implemented two messages going from the master to the slave to put it first into standby mode and second to reboot it. And with all that together, we managed after <laughs> jumping through a lot of hoops to implement a reliable and repeatable procedure to reboot that thing into a defined state. Card here. Link in the description. At the end of the video, I promised you that next time we will actually read out some magnetic measurements from that thing. And that's exactly what we do today. Enjoy. But before we do that, a little bit of housekeeping. You remember that I moaned about that in the private part of our class, our Type Def Union MOSI message contains a lot of seemingly unnecessary stuff. For example, we have here in the last two members we implemented here, the first one, the reboot, and the second one, the standby, we just have to repeat here <clears throat> unused struct members, which we initialize to zero in the related methods. And uh, we completely have to duplicate that stuff here. And uh, I didn't like it. But we have also these unused variables here in the other struct members, which we just initialize to zero. Yeah. And that's what the implementation of the related methods looked like. So here's the send reboot and the send standby. Uh, we just initializing all the unused stuff always to zero. And for reboot and standby, there is only unused stuff in our message, but for the marker and opcode, which we of course set to. It's a wee bit better for the other methods, like for example, the send knob, where we actually here uh, set a key and uh, but we still have to initialize everything else to zero. And uh, that's just <clears throat> unnecessary code in my opinion. I solved that the following way. So we still have, of course, our type def union MOSI message, but now our struct members only need unused members when we need those to align the used members to the exact byte position within our 8-byte array. Uh, see part 1, card here, link in the description to how that union stuff works in general and how we use it specifically here in the library. And that means that after the knob we do not have any more <laughs> the reboot and the standby struct because, yeah, it only contained unused stuff. How can we achieve that? Simple. By adding constructors to our enum, which is an enum class. So you can use methods, including constructors, for that enum. So here I have the default constructors and you see here I have here an initializer for our 8-byte bytes array. That's here simply a zero initializer, initializing all 8 bytes to zero. And then I have a second constructor here, mosi message with the arguments marker marker and mosi opcode opcode, which initializes also the unused stuff, unused array, to this time explicitly one, two, three, four, five, six bytes filled with zero. 
and then we fill the marker and the opcode and finally we initialize the CRC also to zero. And with that, the related methods are suddenly a lot shorter and easier to build. So when we declare here our local variable mozi message, mozi message, I use the constructor with the two arguments, the marker and the mozi opcode. And then here for knob, I just send, uh, set the key here and the knob key. I don't have to care about that unused stuff that came before the key because yeah, the constructor takes care of that. And then I do yeah, return send mozi message. And send reboot and send standby are even easier. I just have here my local variable with a constructor where I pass other and reboot uh, respectively marker other and mozi opcode standby. And then I pass my local variable to the send mozi message. Much more elegant, much more readable. And of course the whole stuff works as before, freshly connecting here my Arduino and opening the serial monitor. And that is exactly the same pa uh, picture we saw last time. So ready hardware version 17, ready firmware version 40 and then knob echo key. Uh, yeah, you saw it before. Back to the regular program that is the promised content. We already talked in the basics video about how that chip can deliver you several kinds of magnetic measurements. Card here, link in the description. First, our chip can measure the magnetic strength of the field in three axes. So it can give you the magnetic field strength of the X, Z and Y component of the field. Nothing new here, we saw that a lot in other 3D magnetometers. Again, refer to all the links in the description of the basics video. Second. It can measure the rotation of a magnetic field around an axis and give you an angle alpha. Also nothing new, we saw other chips before that did the same. Again, refer to all the links in the description of the basics video. Third. It can measure the direction of a field in three dimensions, giving you two angles, alpha and beta, which describe exactly the direction of the field in space. And that's actually something new we never saw before. What we also never saw before was a chip that, co <laughs> that can deliver you all three kinds of data. We also already talked about the so-called marker and the regular versus other messages in the first the details video card here, link in the description. Short recap about the marker. That's just two bits in each and every message sent from the slave to the master or the master to the slave. Up to now, we only used the marker one, one designating other messages. But now we will use the markers 00 for, yeah, alpha messages, just measuring the rotation of the field, alpha beta messages, measuring the exact direction of the field in 3D space, and the well-known X, Y, Z messages 01. If we have a look at the opcode table in the datasheet, we see that we have three MISO opcodes for regular messages, but these are not alpha, alpha, beta, X, Y, Z. They are get one, get two and get three. Hexadecimal one, three, one, four, one, five. The opcode here does not determine which data you are requesting. That is the marker. 
that is in effect you have three different opcodes here and each opcode can through the marker request three different kinds of data that is you have a total of nine MOSI messages going from the master to the slave requesting a specific kind of data in a specific way. And the way or how Malexis puts it, the trigger mode is determined by the opcode. Uh, so get one, get two, get three. And the trigger modes are aptly named <laughs> trigger mode one, two and three. We will talk about trigger mode two and three in the future, but for now let's stick with trigger mode get one. And that works <laughs> as expected. So you send a get mosi message to the slave and in the next SPI transaction you get back the uh, magnetic data you requested. And then you can send another get message to the slave and in the next SPI transaction you get back the data for that request. And we talked about that uh, interleave between SPI transactions before in the previous video. Now, all these get messages, get one, get two, get three, have basically the same format. I'm showing you here in the datasheet the get one MOSI message. So they only differ in the opcode. Byte zero is empty, byte one contains a reset flag that doesn't reset the chip, but only an internal counter inside the chip. We will talk about that counter more when we talk about the meso messages coming back. Then we have here in byte two and three, a 16 bit timeout value in microseconds. That's not a communication timeout, that's kind of a data timeout. Meaning if that time is over, the chip throws away the data you requested and in the next SPI transaction you only get back an error message or a nothing to transmit message. Byte 4 and 5 are unused and like in all messages, byte 7 contains the CRC. Now let's implement all those nine MISO messages in one single go. So in the public part of our class definition, we have nine new send get methods. So here get one, two, three, get one, two, three, get one, two, three, alpha, 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 beta, alpha, beta, alpha, beta, x, y, z, x, y, z, x, y, z. Yeah. And each and every of these send get function gets as an argument a boolean reset roll counter which is optional and by default false and an unsigned 16-bit integer data timeout that defaults to the maximum value. Uh, both arguments being optional because usually we won't use them I guess. In the private part of our class definition, we added to the enum mosi opcode the three values for get1, get2 and get3. Also in the private part of our class, we extended the union mosi message by a member get, which is of course a struct get and the struct has the members unsigned integer 8 unused. That's just the byte zero for alignment of the rest. And then we have an unsigned integer eight reset roll counter. Only the least significant bit here is of interest. That's the reset roll counter bit. And finally, an unsigned integer 16 bit data timeout microseconds. Finally, we have a new private method, a Boolean send get which gets a marker as an argument so the marker for alpha alpha beta or xyz 
then an opcode as an argument, that's obviously get one, get two, or get three, a bool reset roll counter, and an unsigned integer 16 bit data timeout microseconds. We're now over in the CPP file of the class and let's first have a look at that private send get method. We already talked about the four parameters. So that is basically a universal send get method for all nine different get methods. And it's styled like every other send method. So first we have here a mosi message, mosi message private variable, which we initialize with a marker and the opcode. And then we fill the get member of our mosi message here with the reset roll counter, the least significant bit either set to one or to zero in dependence of our reset roll counter argument. And then we set the data timeout in microseconds to our data timeout in microseconds argument. And finally, we do a return send mosi message. With that private method in place, the actual implementation of the public send get methods is really primitive. So we have here a send get one alpha, which gets us an argument. We already talked about that optional reset roll counter defaulting to false and the data timeout in microseconds also optional defaulting to the maximum value. And then we just call a return send get with the marker alpha, the meso opcode get one and our reset roll counter and data timeout arguments. And it's the same for get to alpha. We're just passing here instead uh, or get one, the opcode get two. And for get three alpha, we pass the opcode get three. Uh, for get one alpha beta, we pass the marker alpha beta and the opcode get one. Get two alpha beta, opcode get two, get three alpha beta, opcode get three, send one XYZ, of course, marker XYZ and opcode get one, send get two XYZ, opcode get two, and finally get three XYZ, opcode get three. That's it. Now that we know how to request those three different kinds of magnetic measurements from our chip in three different ways, what can we expect to get back as a meso message? First thing you notice is there are no opcodes for that messages going from our slave to our master. And yeah, this is basically just a big blank space here in the data sheet saying regular data packet. But in fact, it's of course three different types of regular data packets we get back. A data packet just containing alpha data, then one containing alpha beta data, and one containing x, y, z data. And here are those three so-called regular messages for alpha, alpha beta, and x, y, z data. There are some similarities between these three message types, and this will be reflected in how we implement them in our meso message union. The parts I marked yellow are identical for all three messages. So of course we have the CRC like in each and every message and we have the marker also like in each and every message. Marker 00, zero for alpha, zero 01 for alpha beta and 10 for x, y, z. But here in the regular messages instead of an opcode we have an roll counter. That's simply a counter that's slowly counting up which each and every message you receive. And it's exactly that counter we can reset with the reset bit in the get messages. Finally, we have the two most significant bits here in byte one, E1 and E0. 
which contains some diagnostic information. Alpha and alpha beta messages contain here in byte 4 a virtual gain, an 8-bit unsigned integer indicating how strong the magnetic field is that we are measuring. Also in both messages you find here in byte 1 and 0 a 14-bit unsigned integer alpha, which is of course an angle between 0 and 360 degrees. In addition, the beta message has a second angle because it's measuring in 3D the direction of the magnetic field beta. Also 14-bit integer unsigned angle between 0 and 360 degrees. The XYZ message delivers us in three 14-bit signed integers the strength of the magnetic field in the X, Y and Z axis. More about these signed integers in a second. The two diagnostic bits in all messages have the following meaning. So 0, 0, first diagnostic sequence not yet finished. So we don't know if everything is okay. 0, 1, diagnostic fail, obviously bad. 1, 0, diagnostic pass in the previous cycle. So somewhere in the past the diagnostics have passed. And 1, 1, that's the best diagnostic pass new cycle completed. So we actually know that the data we get is okay. The 14-bit signed integers in our XYZ messages are fortunately encoded as two's complementaries. And our Arduino also uses two's complementary to encode signed integer values. So all we have to do is to shift those 14 bits two bits to the left to get a 16-bit signed value. Please note that the real resolution is only 12 bits. Let's have a look at the code then, shall we? So in the public part of our class definition, we have a new enum diagnostic. These are just those two diagnostic bits. So unfinished diagnostic, 0, 0, Failed diagnostic 0, 1, passed previously 1, 0, and passed currently 1, 1. We already implemented the markers for alpha, alpha, beta, and xyz in the first part. Then we have a whole bunch of new public methods, last sketch, which we can use to extract the different data fields from those regular meso messages, which we requested, of course, with some get mosi messages. The first two methods, last get diagnostic and last get roll counter, are available for alpha, alpha, beta, and xyz messages. Get diagnostic, of course, returns these two diagnostic bits as an enum, and get roll counter returns the 6 bit roll counter in an 8 bit unsigned integer. The next three methods last get virtual gain, last get alpha raw, and last get alpha degree are only available for alpha and alpha beta messages. Last get virtual gain returns that unsigned integer 8 bit virtual gain. The last get alpha raw returns the raw 16 bit signed integer representing the alpha angle. And last get alpha degree already returns that as a float between 0 and 360 degrees. The next two methods, <laughs> last get beta raw and last get beta degree, are naturally <laughs> available only for the alpha beta messages. And they do exactly the same like uh, get alpha raw and get alpha degree just for the beta angle. Finally, we have the last get x, y, and z methods which are of course only available for the XYZ messages and they return the XYZ magnetic field strength as a signed 16-bit integer. In the private part of our class definition, 
We extended the Union MISO message by a new member regular, which is a struct regular and contains all the data fields that are common to all regular messages. So first we have here a byte varying one, that's just for byte alignment. Then we have here a second byte diagnostic which contains the two diagnostic bits as the most significant bits. Then we have four more bytes of varying content just here for alignment. So we get finally here to the last byte, which is our marker and roll counter. We have a second new member, alpha beta, which is a struct alpha beta and contains the data which is delivered by alpha or alpha beta messages. So first we have here a two byte alpha, which contains in the 14 LSBs the alpha angle. And then we have here a two byte beta, which contains in the 14 LSBs, the beta angle. Of course, that's only available for the alpha beta messages. And finally, the virtual gain. That's this eight bit magnetic field strength indicator. Finally, we have a third new member XYZ, a struct XYZ containing the data for the XYZ messages. So three times two bytes for X, Y and Z field strength. And we're already in the CPP file of the class. And here I extended modified the private method valid marker opcode. So I first check here now if we are handling a message with the marker other, if that's the case, I go through the loop as in the previous version and check if the opcode contained in the marker opcode is one of the opcodes we already know. No need to check here if it's really a marker other anymore because we do that outside here. If we find the marker as before, we uh, the opcode as before, we return true. Otherwise, if it's another marker, so alpha, alpha beta or x, y, z, we also return true. And uh, yeah, if we if it's the wrong marker and the wrong opcode, we return false. And we are already looking at the implementation of our new public last get methods. Starting here with the diagnostic, we just take the last MISO message, a regular member, the diagnostic byte, and we shift the two bits with the diagnostic information six to the right. So from the most significant bit position into the least significant bit position, we cast that into the diagnostic enum and we return it. Last get roll counter is even easier. We take our regular message marker roll counter and we mask that with the bits that contain the roll counter and we return that as unsigned in Tetra 8. Then we have the last get virtual gain, even simpler. We just return meso message. It's an alpha beta message, the virtual gain field. Hmm. Last get alpha raw uh, takes the meso message, an alpha beta message, the alpha angle within it, and we just mask out the bits that are not relevant for the alpha angle. Remember, these were the diagnostic bits. And we return that as a 16 bit unsigned integer. Last get alpha in degrees just uses last get alpha raw and we convert that into degrees by simply multiplying it with 316 degrees and dividing it by 2 to the power of 14, so 16384. Remember, our alpha data has only 14 bits. Last get beta raw and last get beta degrees works exactly the same. We're just using here the beta field in the alpha beta member of our meso message. 
Finally, we have last get x, y and z, which all three work exactly the same. So we take the meso message x, y, z and either x, y and z. And as we saw in the data sheet, it was described. We shift that value two bits to the left to get a signed 16-bit integer, which we return. In the sketch itself, I created a new function serial print mlx9363 last, which gets as an argument a reference to our mlx9363 class. And I first do here a switch over the last marker we received. And if the marker is alpha, I do a nice printout of that alpha message with the diagnostic, the virtual gain, the roll counter, alpha raw and alpha in degrees. And we will have a look at that zero print MLX90363 diagnostic in a second. Then I do the same for the marker alpha beta. The start is basically the same and then I print also the beta raw and the beta degrees. And the same here for the marker x, y, z. I print the diagnostics, the roll counter and then the x, y and z component of the magnetic field. And the rest here, if the marker is other, that switch statement. We already saw that in previous versions. That is simply what was contained previously in the loop. And then we have here the zero print MLX and so on diagnostic, which gets a prefix. So just that we know what diagnostic we printed and we decode the diagnostic a num like that. So zero print prefix and then uh, a switch statement over the diagnostic, printing out unfinished, failed, passed previously and passed currently. The only other change is actually in the loop. Setup is exactly the same. So first I do here a send get one alpha and if there's an error, we do the usual, we handle that error. Otherwise, I do a zero print MLX90363 last. And this shouldn't give us any data. Remember, we only receive the data from the send get alpha in the next SPI transaction. So I'm waiting here one millisecond in the data sheet. It says uh, to, yeah, the processing of a get one alpha is finished after T S S ref E. However, that is not directly specified in the data sheet and we will have to <laughs> talk about timings uh, with that chip a little bit more in the future. Anyway, I wait here just one millisecond and then I send a knob and that knob should receive in return the result, so the regular message as a reply to our send get alpha. Again, uh, if that fails, I handle the error. Otherwise, I serial print the MLX90363 last again. And then I wait 500 milliseconds and we start again. Now, why do I do that? I could just loop uh, here the send get one alpha and uh, latest with the second call to send get one alpha, I should get really a regular message with alpha data back. However, remember that data timeout in microseconds, it's a maximum of two to the power of 16. So approximately 65,000 microseconds, which is approximately 65 milliseconds. And uh, yeah, printing out every 65 milliseconds, all that stuff, uh, that would crowd my serial port to the serial monitor. And 
if I wait longer than 65 milliseconds until I send the next command, the chip will time out the data and throw it away. So I first do a send get alpha and then immediately after the minimal possible delay, do a send knob to get actually that regular alpha message and print the data contained it out. Ah, yeah, timing with that chip is really critical. As we will see, we'll experiment a little bit with all that stuff. That was a whole lot of code, but now let's enjoy the fruit of our labor. Uh, yeah, uh, just plugging in here, you see on the other side is our sensor. And we start the serial monitor and we have here first the usual thing. So hardware version 17 and firmware version 40 and then alpha diagnostic failed. Simple. I have still the magnet here, which belongs there. Uh, virtual gain is 41. It's quite high. Uh, roll counter is 1, 2, uh, zero, one, two, three, and so on. And we get an alpha raw value and an alpha in degrees. Uh, but of course, these values mean nothing because our diagnostic failed. So let's activate auto scroll and put that magnet near our sensor. So you see that the diagnostic changed to pass currently. Our virtual gain is down to 11. Our roll counter is still counting up and uh, yeah, it just resetted. So after, uh, <laughs> if it overflows, it resets. And I'm a little bit, yeah, uh, the roll counter is just six bits. So 265, so 64. It goes from zero to 63. And uh, if you want to go to 64, it rolls back to zero. We can see that in a second. 60, one, three, zero. Okay, perfect. Everything's working. And you see the alpha in degree angle. And I'm just turning here now, slowly but surely. And you see The angle is decreasing. I need some con Lego, con Lego Technic uh, contraption here to do that a little bit more precise. But yeah, you see the principle. Well, we're already over the zero degree mark and going into the other direction now. Yeah. And you see the virtual gain when I put the magnet spot on goes down to seven. And if I take the magnet a little bit up, it goes up to 28, 35, 39. We can still measure something. 41. We can still measure an angle. And yeah, here it fails. Passed currently, virtual gain 41. So this is the maximum distance about I can do. Hmm, interesting. Next, I wanted to test the reset roll counter flag and of course off camera, it didn't work. Reason being, <clears throat> I got the conditional statement here in our send get method completely false. Uh, did I mention it's already over 30 degrees again? So instead of the question mark and the colon, I here had just commas which compiled but didn't make any sense. Anyways, we have now here a send get one alpha true. And we will upload that now and have a look at the serial monitor if our roll counter is really resetting. And indeed our roll counter stays zero and the rest is, come on, 
pass currently still working as expected. Very nice. Next, I set our data timeout here to 30,000 microseconds, so 30 milliseconds, and I increased here the delay to 35 milliseconds. So we expect now to see nothing to transmit on error message because the data the chip creates after we send him here, the send get one alpha is getting too old by the time we getting the data back here with the send knob. Let's see. Just opening the serial monitor and there we see, okay, the usual, ready and then nothing to transmit, error code NTT, nothing to transmit, error code NTT, and so on and so on, because yeah, the chip simply threw the measurement away. Now I increased that near to the maximum again as an argument passed to 65,000 microseconds, so 65 milliseconds. And that should be a long enough time out, so our delay of 35 milliseconds shouldn't matter anymore. Let's test that. And after upload, opening the serial monitor and There we are again. I don't know why it's uh, jumping this time. I have absolutely no idea, but... Yeah, we are passing and we are measuring. Sorry for the jumping. Hmm. Didn't did that before. Was so nicely aligned. Uh, anyway, let's continue. Everything is back to zero, that is a delay to one, and we're passing no longer any arguments here at our send get one message, but we are sending now a send get one alpha beta message. Let's have a look at that. And indeed, <laughs> we get back an alpha beta with a diagnostic failed because no magnet here. Uh, Everything else is the same, but we get now a second angle. Better raw and better degree. And you can already see these values are different. I'm using another magnet now. And let's see if we can, okay, pass currently. Just moving the magnet a little bit. And yeah, both values change. Now I urgently need a contraption to actually position that magnet over the sensor. I think about uh, Lego Technic again. And finally, let's test the send get one XYZ method. Okay, uh, output format is of course different. Uh, diagnostic failed, uh, I have still my magnet here. Uh, the roll counter, we don't have that virtual gain. And we have an X, Y, Z uh, value which are, yeah, fluctuating. Wild, not wildly, but they are fluctuating and they are invalid because diagnostic failed. Now, <clears throat> let's see what yeah, and they are changing. Can I get some higher negative values? Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. What can I say? It works. That's it for today. <laughs> I know that was a whole lot of code, but at one point we had to implement all that stuff. Next time we will, I have no idea, uh, probably explore these uh, three different measurement functions a little bit more in depth with some uh, contraption made out of Lego Technic so we can have uh, some repeatable measurements or something like that. Till then, Bye.